Okay, I think we can get started now. So again, hello and a warm welcome to everyone attending this webinar today. My name is Kadla. I work as a Social Sustainability and Integrity Project Manager at Global Compact Network UK, and I'm going to be your moderator for the day. So this is the first webinar in the Business um, Action for Women, Peace and Security series. And today we will be focusing on women, peace and security agenda and how it relates to businesses worldwide. So the reason why this event came to be is because 2020 marks the 20th anniversary of the launch of the UN Global Compact, but it also marks the 20th anniversary of uh, the United Nations Security Council Resolution uh, 1325. And this resolution established the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And um, so despite the progress that both initiatives have done over the past two decades, the links between the two still remain somewhat unexplored. So this series aims to start a conversation about this and um, to really bring attention to how businesses can make positive contributions to uh, the WPS agenda. So before we begin with the presentations, um, I would just like to draw your attention to a few technical matters. So if you're having any uh, difficulties accessing the sound or any other technical difficulties at all, please feel free to use the chat function. Uh, it should be at the bottom of your screens uh, and I'll do my best to help. And if for some reason you're having issues joining the audio, it might be, uh, you might wish to try listening uh, into the webinar via the phone dial-in details we sent you um, an hour before the webinar. And in addition to the chat box, uh, this webinar also features a Q&A box, which you can use to ask our panelists any questions you may have. So um, just to flag, everyone attending is on mute but uh, you are welcome to, to send in your questions and any remarks through these two boxes. So um, we have a great lineup of speakers today, so let me just introduce everyone briefly. Uh, so on the line today we have uh, Nikola Popovic, Maha Abdallah and uh, Michelle Breslauer. So um, Michelle, um, Michelle is a Senior Manager for Governance at Peace at uh, the United Nations Global Compact. And we're very happy to have her on the line today supporting um, supporting the UK network. And she regularly encourages businesses to adopt sustainable and socially responsible policies. Michelle has spoken extensively on a range of issues related to uh, peace, security, terrorism, uh, justice and development in a number of fora, including the United Nations and the World Bank as well as uh, different think tanks, conferences, and uh, universities. And we also have two independent experts on women, peace, and security, and business and human rights with us today. So Nicola uh, is the co-founder and director of uh, Gender Associations, which is a consultancy firm uh, with a network of over 200 experts on gender, peace, and security issues worldwide. She has worked as a gender specialist for 15 years in multilateral organizations, uh, civil society organizations and uh, governmental bodies. And her thematic experience includes policy development, capacity building, action oriented research and monitoring and evaluation with a focus on gender, peace and security. Um, and she has also um, led uh, and coordinated programs and projects that specifically focus on uh, the private sector and gender sensitive security sector reform. And last but not least, we have Maha Abdallah with us today. So Maha is an international advocacy officer at the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies which is a independent regional NGO that aims to promote human rights in the Middle East and North Africa. She previously worked as senior legal researcher and advocacy officer at Al Haq, uh, which is a Palestinian independent NGO. And her work there largely focused on business and human rights and corporate accountability in situations of conflict. Since 2018, Mahas has, has also served on the project advisory group of ESCR Net's corporate capture project. So this is our agenda for today. 
Um, so after a brief overview of the UK network, which will be presented by Steve Kenzie, uh, the executive director of the UK network, um, our three panelists will take the floor. And finally, in the last 15 minutes of the event, we'll have time to answer some questions uh, that you can send in. So um, you can send these questions in at any time and then we'll answer, it, answer them at the end. With, so without further ado, uh, Steve, over to you. Thanks very much, Carla. Uh, thanks to our speakers for joining us. Thanks to our attendees for joining us. We always, um, while obviously Global Compact is very familiar to many, it's not familiar to everyone. And so we're gonna just take a moment for those of you that are perhaps not already uh, participating in Global Compact, just to give you a little bit of information about our initiative and encourage you um, to get involved. Uh, as Carla noted, it's our 20th anniversary um, and Kofi Annan uh, launched us back in 2000 with the idea of getting uh, companies around the world to commit to universal principles that would guide their operations um, to respect human rights, labor rights, the environment, and, and anti-corruption principles. And so our principles are here before you, and they're all drawn from UN treaties, and they're truly universal. So I, I can see already, I recognize some names uh, from the participant list, so I know we have a fairly international audience here. Wherever you're, you're dialing in from, uh, these principles will be relevant to you and your business. Um, it's pretty clear, I think, without explicitly being stated, principle one, two, and six are all highly relevant. Really, all of the human rights and labor principles um, linked into the um, WPS agenda. So we, we feel um, this is a long overdue link up that we're, we're trying to make here today. Next slide, please, Carla. To join the Global Compact, um, your organization's CEO needs to make uh, three commitments in a letter to the UN Secretary General to operationalize our 10 principles, to be transparent and report annually on the progress you're making uh, towards that objective, and to support the wider UN development agenda. Now we typically, um, this slide would be followed by a slide with a picture of the sustainable development goals, but today um, it's the WPS agenda and I think um, that's something we would encourage all of our participating organizations to be more familiar with and make sure they're supporting. There are 68 global compact networks around the world um, that provide more bespoke engagement opportunities for organizations that are participating in this initiative. Um, here in the UK, we seek to inspire business ambition, to enable business action and to shape the environment in which business operates um, to create a world uh, that we want to live and do business in. Um, we organize over 50 events a year across a very wide range of subject areas. And I know that my colleagues in other local networks around the world are doing the same. So I would really encourage you um, to have a look um, and see what's happening in your country. And if you're not, if you're here in the UK and um, not a member, then do please get in touch. With that, I'm very happy to pass back to Carla and I hope you find this session interesting. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. So as Steve mentioned, uh, I think we have a very international and diverse audience uh, today. And I'm aware that some of you may be more familiar with the WPS agenda than others. So just very briefly, we'll go over a few uh, key points to get everyone acquainted uh, with the agenda and to get everyone on the same page. So. Uh, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda was um, initiated in 2000, um, so 20 years ago, by the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. This resolution remains a landmark resolution that underscores the importance of having a gender perspective on peace and security. And since this moment, uh, more about nine other Security Council resolutions in this uh, framework have been uh, have been launched, and many civil society organisations and activists all around the world have been advocating for the full implementation of of this uh, resolution. 
and a growing number of member states as well have been uh, developing their national action plans for implementing uh, 1325. And each year in October, the uh, Secretary General submits a report on the progress of its implementation. And finally, the four pillars that, um, that this agenda is often described in, in terms of are uh, participation, protection, prevention and relief and recovery. But I think I'll leave uh, Nicola to speak about this in a little more detail. So next up, we've got Nicola's presentation. So over to you. Thank you so much. Um, you can uh, immediately um, go to the next slide. I'm really delighted to, to be here and I will just outline very quickly the four pillars of the Women Peace Security Agenda. So participation um, of women in peace processes um, and in all levels of peace building, but for example also as the last resolution um, on women, of the Women Peace Security Agenda that was adopted in August this year, focuses also in peacekeeping. Um, there, like from the pillars, there's a um, there's a quite a weight on the participation pillar. Um, also, due to studies that have found that, for example, when women participate in peace processes, the likelihood that these peace processes are more sustainable is a lot higher. But also, efficiencies, for example, in peacekeeping operations um, increase when there's more gender and um, gender balance, but also more, more diversity. And peace building initiatives seem to have a, a longer lasting impact. The other very heavy pillar of the Women Peace Security Agenda is the protection pillar, and it focuses largely on the protection from sexual and gender based violence. Um, it, especially in the aftermath of um, the armed conflicts in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, this uh, issue has been um, highly and widespread debated in the, in, in the public, but also stipulated an initiation um, of development of international law, which uh, Maha will talk later about too, about like the other relating documents and um, global commitments that exist around the women, peace and security agenda. One of the pillars that has less weight is the prevention pillar. Nevertheless, um, I believe that especially in this year where we have faced not armed conflict in all of the countries, but a global health pandemic, um, a global crisis, the prevention pillar and what it means um, to work towards um, stable and peaceful societies and the relevance of gender roles and recognizing and um, the gender dimension to unequal power relations, but also to conflict potential is, is, has become very apparent and important. The last pillar is the relief and recovery pillar that focuses to a large extent to humanitarian leave and action and the importance of a gender perspective there um, in, in that area. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So um, while the, the One Peace and Security Agenda, which is by now a, a whole set of resolutions that is embedded by another provisions and commitments of international law, while this agenda has been largely um, addressed the responsibility of governments and nation states to implement certain provisions. There are a, a large, um, there are a large number of actors that also have a role to play. So the implementation, um, for example, has been has been done systematically by the United Nations and international organizations, including NATO, including regional organizations such as the EU, who have developed action plans, indicators, uh, comprehensive approaches. Um, and um, it measure, tools of measurements. Um, by now, there are over 80 nation, like nations that have developed national action plans on the resolution 1325 and the fellow resolutions to implement the Women, Peace, Security agenda systematically. And there have been uh, a large number of civil society organizations that have pushed for this agenda to happen and to go to the Security Council, but also that keep um, governments in, in check if the implementation is, is really happening and who, who work a lot on the very central issues on, on the ground, who work on, on gender equality initiatives from shelter for women who have suffered sexual and gender-based violence or men who have suffered sexual and gender-based violence in and outside armed conflict who have who try to engage different communities into dialogue in, in post-conflict situations 
um, and so forth. There are a lot, like civil society plays a large role. Um, but as part of civil society, of course, the private sector can play an even bigger role as it is playing already. Um, of course, the, the private sector has an impact on all our lives and therefore in all our lives and all our stages on our identities, how we identify as male, as female, um, and in different, uh, in our social class, um, it plays a role how, how we are seen, how we feel ourselves and how we connect ourselves with certain qualities, with certain um, factors. And so there is a, is a very strong relationship between the private sector through its products, what is like available on the market, to whom it is marketed for, um, how it is outreached, to whom, um, what is invested in and what not and how, um, and um, who by that, like how um, the, the influence, for example, on, on how we relate to each other and how we identify, therefore has also the private sector and the products and its, its positioning in the market has also an impact how we see ourselves in relation to others and therefore how we establish gender relations, how we establish dynamics among ourselves and therefore has an impact on and a potential to influence conflict development but also peaceful development. Um, I would go into some examples how, how that could look like but just to, to imagine, um, for example, if products are made like for men or women and they come in a certain size and a certain color with certain connotations underlining certain characteristics um, certain professions, for example, dolls for women that only work in certain professions or toys for boys that only stipulate certain areas of development. These have an enormous influence on how we see ourselves and how we envision ourselves. And it can have an enormous impact how we feel included or excluded in society. And therefore it can ha have an enormous uh, factor, like an influence on how we how, how the potential of conflict among ourselves um, is, is stipulated through, through any, almost any private sector product. And there I include like from corp like big corporate companies to small business owners. And of course, the organizational culture inside the um, organization plays another role. Who's promoted, who's hired, um, who's taken seriously within our organization. What um, happens when, when there are unfair treatments against certain people based on certain char characteristics. So I think there has been a large shift in the last years um, how about the role of the private sector in, in terms of corporate social responsibility in, term, in terms of global principles such as from the, the UN Global Compact also on, on gender equality but also um, what is very striking that in the last year um, consumer attitude and awareness has risen enormously so issues like child labor sustainable production um, environmental impact have become very high on the agenda but also in terms of organizational culture and etiquette issues like um, sexual harassment um, sexual exploitation and abuse has been increasingly put out into the public um, if we remember for example campaigns like me too so there's a huge shift of awareness and the role that companies play and can play and that goes much beyond the mere production of a certain product and of course there are companies like um, for example um, ourselves that work directly on women peace and security related services or products next slide please so what are good practices or what can be done in terms of engaging into the women, peace and security agenda and make a change? So one, of course, is the self-reflection and the societal impact each company has. So how is my product actually affecting different people? How does it make different people feel? Um, are we only targeting a certain type of culture? Um, do we establish certain hierarchies or are we saying like this is like how how do we um, design, who do we design a product for? Um, then also, for example, there, then I want to jump to the last point here. It's also how we package a product about the marketing, the communication, who do we say, uh, who are we using? What faces, what um, people, how diverse is the, the commercials that we're producing and, and we're shaping for? And um, 
Then there's, of course, one of the good practices I wanted to highlight. We have done a, a study with Global Network for Women Peace Builders, looking into costing and financing specifically on um, women, peace and security issues a couple of years ago. And we looked at, for example, companies like Avon and their foundations um, confronting violence against women. And there you see a campaign on, on the slide, but also they have um, supported a justice center at the um, Conwell University for um, women's rights in particular. So there's a lot of, like there's one, um, another entry point towards women peace security is through charities, through foundations, through uh, specific programs that look into the empowerment of women, for example, or such as Cisco that did direct investment in conflict, post-conflict societies in Rwanda and Palestine, for example, where they were saying, okay, we look into specifically uh, creating employment and job opportunities in post-conflict situations, creating um, perspectives and economic um, empowerment in that sense in situations where they're, they're almost most needed. Going even beyond that, um, there's an example by UN Women, but many other organizations, but by, men, by UN Women Kosovo in their transitional justice program, using microcredit schemes within a post-conflict context to allow small businesses to grow by women who have been particularly uh, affected by armed conflict and gender-based violence. But of course, um, confront like the organizational culture and principles how an organization reacts to cases of sexual harassment through, for example, codes of conduct, uh, leading by example, putting women in decision-making um, positions and maybe women with, uh, of, of different shades of color, um, in, with diff dis different sets of abilities um, from different backgrounds. Um, that is of course also changing and is, um, could be a good practice to have decision makers that come from um, a variety um, of backgrounds. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so I'm already come, came to an end um, and I wasn't sure if to include this because normally I'm, I'm not um, mixing personal and professional life, but this is uh, my daughter and my daughter has Down syndrome. And she looks at a uh, publicity in a supermarket, which um, the title says, um, when, when I hear you can't, I'm, I'm just smiling. So I just wanted to highlight that when I, when I saw her looking at this, I just realized that when I was young, diversity was not very present in commercials. And I think it makes an incredible difference if we, if, if young, if the younger generation sees themselves in the diversity they are in like or in like as diverse as our children are if they can identify themselves and feel included in our societies i think that's one of the first steps closer to peaceful societies um so i wanted to share that to close my presentation thank you thank you very much nicola that was that was very interesting and i think a very fitting introduction to this conversation um, we'll now move on to uh, Maha Abdallah. So Maha, over to you for your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Carla and Nicola, and thank you for uh, putting together this important webinar as well. In uh, my presentation today, I will give a brief over overview of how corporations undermine human rights in conflict-affected areas, including women's rights. I will also provide some uh, recommendations for businesses based on uh, international law, the UN Guiding Principles, and international humanitarian law in particular, and drawing from some uh, case studies that I have previously looked at. And uh, throughout my experience in researching uh, corporate involvement in violations of international law in conflict affected areas and interacting with the various international bodies and mechanisms, primarily at the United Nations, as well as with companies, the gender dimension of uh, corporate related human rights abuses So, for example, as part of the collective efforts by civil society through the legally binding instrument at the United Nations, it has been necessary to emphasize 
that beyond direct violence and unjust structures, corporate actors through their activities and relationships in conflict affected areas do undermine women's economic, social, cultural, civil and political rights. They drive militarization and violence in some instances and they intensify patriarchal norms. So in this respect, it has been uh, crucial to ensure that a gender responsive lens is adopted throughout such a forthcoming treaty, but also more generally, to allow for the protection of rights and access to remedy without any discrimination. And unfortunately, uh, corporations, both at whether national or transnational corporations have an infamous record of taking advantage of instabilities and ongoing conflicts to expand activities and to make more, more profits. Um, this is also because business activities in this context are usually uh, poorly regulated and lack the appropriated and effective mechanisms of accountability, but also lack a redress for victims. Meanwhile, we have women, whether in conflict or in peace times, who face extensive discrimination, entrenched systems of gender inequality, racism, patriarchal domination in different ways, and thereby marginalizing them and undermining their rights, and as well as their well-being and safety. And when we look at conflict affected areas, women and girls are particularly vulnerable to the numerous conflict related violations and do suffer heavily from the consequences of conflict. And despite different attempts within the international framework, including, for example, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325, women are not only continuously being excluded from peace agreement and agreements and political negotiations, but they also continue to be discriminated against within work environments and disproportionately affected by corporate related abuses. And this results in poor and dangerous labor conditions, lower and inconsistent wages, increased vulnerability to harassment, physical abuse and sexual violence. And again, in conflict affected areas, such injustices against women are even worse. And then when looking at areas of uh, conflict, we, 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 like with the private sector, it can and has and indeed undermined women's rights in many ways through their activities and relationships. And it has often rendered the private sector to either be involved in and or perpetrating actions that violate human rights, which are also women's rights. And these range from infringing on the right to self-determination, access and sovereignty over natural resources like land and water, to property confiscation, versus restricting freedom of movement, the right to health, work and access to livelihoods, the right to adequate housing and violations that stem from environmental impacts and destruction, as well as gender-based and sexual violence. So the actions of uh, irresponsible businesses in conflict affected areas could and indeed have resulted in instances of uh, displaced communities, violent evictions, destruction of resources, which do impact women disproportionately as a vulnerable group. And there are different ways through which the private sector could try and alter this reality for women and girls around the world and help advance the women, peace and security agenda specifically, but also more broadly, which is very critical at a time when the world is facing a lot of, challenging, a lot of challenges ranging from ongoing and prolonged conflicts to climate change and pandemics. And the most direct way, in my opinion, to do that would be not to contribute to further infringements in situations of conflict, including on women's rights. And in the next uh, few minutes, I will address some of the steps that companies and the private sector could and should consider to implement in conflict affected areas in order to respect human rights and women's rights. I will of course not be able to cover all possible actions or the ones and or the ones that I propose extensively, but these are some of the points that I thought would be worth highlighting today. To start with, obviously the, the enhanced and ongoing due diligence procedures where businesses need to look at their operations and relationships in uh, conflict affected areas and base any decisions made in this regard on assessments of human rights risks under international law, 
through processes of uh, rigorous and ongoing human rights due diligence. And these processes should take place before, during and after the work is uh, conducted in these uh, contexts. Unfortunately, in uh, many of the instances, such processes are often lacking or non-existent with corporations in conflict areas due to, to varying reasons. And in doing so, in, in, doing, in conducting a human rights due diligence uh, procedure, uh, businesses need to evaluate actual and potential adverse impacts that their activities may cause or contribute to in that specific setting. Businesses also need to determine whether and how they may be able to positively contribute to the development of the conflict affected area in question in a way that is consistent with the rights of the communities or populations or inhabitants of that specific area, their need and will and without infringing on their rights, including the right to life, health, security, privacy and others. And such a process of course, must incorporate a gender responsive lens that would give special attention to women and girls who often face heightened risks of violations of human rights in, in such settings. And here it is important that businesses acknowledge and accordingly act to the fact that business related human rights abuses do not impact everybody in the same way. Different groups, including women and girls, are impacted differently and disproportionately and face additional barriers to justice due to already existing structural forms of discrimination and inequality. And as a first step, uh, part of uh, any company's enhanced human rights due diligence is to acknowledge and understand the context in which it's operating in. And this is important to knowing that what, what their responsibilities under the relevant laws are in this case, like or in the case of uh, conflict, particularly international humanitarian law. It is important to understand the specific context as well in order to understand what are the specific impacts and ramifications of their activities on the specific categories and people or and groups. And companies as well need to know and recognize that international human humanitarian law does also apply to them and that they would need to respect it in these, uh, in these uh, situations. Otherwise, if a company is, does not know or simply decides to ignore the applicability of international humanitarian law in relation to its, uh, its, its uh, presence or activities or relationship in a particular area, it could result, uh, result in serious implications and high risks of being involved or complicit in grave breaches of international law, which may also constitute recognize, internationally recognized crimes, exposing the company and its personnel to liability at different levels. And more concretely, some of the additional practical steps of enhanced human rights due diligence by corporations would include simply not to pursue operations in situations in which due diligence cannot be conducted or guarantee that they will not be complicit or contribute to violations, grave breaches or, or crimes. It, uh, I mean, if a business is unable to prevent or mitigate adverse impacts and cannot increase, uh, use or increase its leverage to do so, then it should um, consider terminating its operations or relationships at all. And then companies should also consider urgent and immediate uh, preventive measures, divestment and disengagement policies to avoid involvement in or contributing to human rights violations throughout their activities and relationships, carry out meaningful consultations with the relevant stakeholders, including affected communities and marginalized groups such as women, and ensure that uh, free prior and informed consent of indigenous peoples as well before starting any project and activity. And then maybe two other uh, final uh, practical recommendations would be for the company to seek advice from the home or host state or both and credible organizations about the potential implications of their activities in a particular affected area, conflict affected area. And lastly, to track the effectiveness of the company's response or measures to the human rights impacts of their activities. And I will conclude by saying that the private sector does have the power to fuel a conflict and sustain it, 
or it also has a power to exercise its leverage and powers to end it and contribute to a durable peace instead. And the, the private sector generally does have an impact and a major one too when it comes to conflict and the rights of the people subject to a particular conflict, including for vulnerable groups like women. And there are many ways that businesses could apply a do no harm principle and be in the even in, in, in the do better category. And in doing so, the private sector will help to ensure that the lives, rights and human dignity of people, including women and other vulnerable groups is protected in times of conflict, where there is already so much dehumanization, violence and impunity. I will stop here and uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Maha, very much. I think this point about uh, not doing any harm, but also doing better is really fitting for this for this session in particular. Um, we're now going to go over to Michelle. Michelle, please feel free to take the floor. Thanks so much. Um, and I agree with you, it was, a, it was a nice compliment to have Nicola and Maha's um, presentations back to back to give a good overview of some of the issues, both from the perspectives of human rights due diligence and doing no harm, and also which positive contributions business can think about making towards inclusion and inclusive business practices. Um, I'm going to speak maybe a little more informally. Um, I am representing the UN Global Compact, so that's our headquarters office um, in New York. And I work on the programs team where we cover a range of different issues. So we work with businesses at the global level, working between the UN, um, normative frameworks and companies, and also with our 68 local networks around the world that are really convening, as Steve said, at the local level. Um, and so to that end, I have a unique vantage point, I think, of being able to see really how businesses are trying to engage in public policy mechanisms, in global governance structures, but also provide some content area support to our local networks that are really working on locally driven dynamics, regulations, policies, and sustainability measures. My portfolio covers governance and peace issues. So I'll speak a little bit today more about um, ways that you can engage with the UN Global Compact on some of these issues. Um, and I think that what's really important to start out with is just to, to say that I, I think this discussion is important and it's important not just because we're celebrating the different anniversaries or acknowledging rather the different anniversaries of the WPS agenda of the UN Global Compact, Beijing plus 25, you know, all these different um, UN 75 important um, moments, but also because as Nicola pointed out, we know so much more about the role of women and the role of gender equality in sustainability and in stability. And so I think the conversation today and the question really for the businesses that are participating is, how do we think about both gender sensitivity and conflict sensitivity when we're thinking about business practices? Um, and there was a recent webinar from one of our colleagues, Christina Bash, um, through our one of our academic working groups that I'll speak to at the end, talking about maximizing business contributions in fragile states. Um, and I've taken some of my notes from her, so I'm happy also to circulate to everybody some of these resources afterwards. Um, but I think that when we're thinking about combining both gender and conflict sensitivity, we start to see the interrelationships between a lot of these issues and why it's not only important, um, but valuable to society and to communities to be sensitive and have heightened awareness and action in both areas. And so when we're talking about becoming a diverse and inclusive workplace, an employer can think of everything from safe working environments to fair wage standards, salary transparency, flexible working hours, 
work-life balance, paid parental leave, child care facilities, well-being and parenting schemes, and education and transport services. And you can think that that's already a range of different issues across labor rights, uh, across human rights, across sustainability. But when we think about not just inclusivity, but also what does it mean to operate in more fragile contexts or contexts where there's heightened violence, um, where there's open armed conflict, where there are greater structural constraints and risks as well, then employers and businesses really have to think much more critically, not only about how they can create a business environment internally that supports gender equality, um, but also how they can participate responsibly in trying to influence governance structures and in trying to influence wider laws, institutions, policies, and systems, because we do need to have those strong, effective, accountable institutions referred to in SDG 16 of the Sustainable Development Goals to counteract some of the work of employers. It's not just the work of businesses here, and it's not just the work of commercial practices. And so I think this is one of the areas that the UN Global Compact is really sitting in, is how do we help foster links between government, civil society, and business so that that wider ecosystem is influenced. And so I wanted to share three kind of bigger level um, ideas and, and statistics coming from some um, empirical analysis and big cross-country studies, primarily coming from the Women, Peace, and Security Index that comes out of Georgetown University, um, Valerie Hudson's work um, coming out of her book, Sex and World Peace, which really looked at the relationships between gender and peace issues. And um, from my previous organization, the Global Peace Index, the Institute for Economics and Peace, you know, what does some of the analysis uh, show about these relationships and why is that compelling, particularly for business? So we've seen, number one, that the security of women is one of the most reliable indicators of the peacefulness of a state. And we know that states that are more peaceful tend to be more profitable as well. So from a commercial perspective, from a sustainability perspective, these are important. And we see that where there are higher levels of gender inequality, whether that's financial, whether it's in terms of employment, areas where there are higher levels of domestic violence, that's correlated with greater risks of violent conflict in society, which also is disruptive to the economy. And then finally, we know and we can see that women and men have very different experiences of safety, of war, and of crisis. So for instance, when we're thinking about safety, um, when we look at Sustainable Development Goal 16, one of the indicators is how safe do you feel walking alone at night? And men and women have completely different experiences here. This speaks not only to the importance of disaggregating our data, but also to thinking differently about the gendered experiences and norms. So about 45% of men in the US, for instance, respond that they do feel safe walking near their homes at night versus 27% for women. That's a very different figure. And that doesn't even start to account for um, race, um, ethnic diversity, et cetera. We know that for instance, in crisis, women are disproportionately affected. Look at some of the statistics around um, domestic violence going up uh, in the pandemic with everyone being at home. Look at the fact that at care-related tasks tend to fall majority on women. Um, their ability to participate in wider decision-making processes is reduced if their, their home responsibilities are increased. They're experiencing conflict and war differently. And this speaks a little bit to some of the prevention pillar that, that Nicola mentioned. And she mentioned also 
that in countries where there are peace processes, those peace processes are much more likely to be effective, implemented, and sustained for the long term when women are involved. So that inclusion element is particularly important. So I wanted to offer two examples um, coming from Colombia. Um, the reason uh, that I'm sharing two from Colombia, from companies we work with and from our local networks is because not only is there was there an armed conflict, there still is, there was a peace agreement signed, we also see high uh, levels of interpersonal violence, um, gender-based violence, so I see we can see a lot of different dynamics in Colombia and some interesting examples as well, not only from our networks but our companies working on these issues. So the first example is thinking about Nestle. Um, most people are familiar with this company. One of their main factories in Colombia experienced over a one year period, five employee deaths. This did not come from inside their operations, but from the community. And so Nestle in Colombia started thinking much more proactively about how they were going to invest in peace building efforts and violence prevention efforts for the safety and stability of their employees, but also the community in which their factories and their operations were located. So they have a range of initiatives. I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of them is the creation of an observatory looking at the different causes of violence in the region. And they're working with academic experts in Colombia, they're working with civil society and NGOs, and they're working with local government, police, attorney, prosecution offices to include all of these different viewpoints within this observatory to gather evidence and data and then to help make recommendations for public policy based on that information. And so one of the key parts of the observatory is also to include um, the Office of Family Services and to pay attention to how violence is affecting women and children as well. So that is built into that plan. Another example is coming from our Columbia local network, so the equivalent of the local network in the UK. And they were collecting best practices from their, their network around contributions to Sustainable Development Goal 16 and Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is around gender equality, Carla showed us um, in the beginning. And so a natural gas company in Colombia wanted to help invest in building the political participation of women to help build peace in a very turbulent region affected by armed conflict there. And so the objective was that basically they wanted to increase the percentage of women who were either running for or elected to public office. Because as we know, having uh, more equal numbers of women in positions of leadership and as elected officials does tend to be correlated with more peaceful societies. So only 13% of people elected by the popular vote were women in this region. And this company created a network with a group of civil society partners to promote political participation with a gender lens training 900 women through workshops, through forums, through events, to help encourage them to participate, to help reduce the fear of being stigmatized because of their participation or discriminated against, and to help influence their, um, their uh, participation in this process. So I can see that in terms of impact, um, during the 2019 elections, they went from three to eight mayors out of 42 municipalities. And so we're already seeing some uptick there. And so I just wanted to share those examples. Um, now, how can you participate via the UN Global Compact? There's 
uh, a few different ways. So one is through working on our women's empowerment programs and our gender equality programs. And those come in two forms. The women's empowerment principles were launched 10 years ago by the UN Global Compact and UN Women. And they're a set of principles that offer guidance to businesses on how to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in the workplace, marketplace, and community. And so companies can sign up to the women's empowerment principles. There are currently 39 CEOs and over 3,600 business leaders that are signed up. And participating companies of the Global Compact can work through their local networks to also engage in target gender equality, which helps provide training and setting of ambitious targets on women's participation and representation. And so our UK local network is one of the networks that is working on this program. We have 19 countries in total that are working on target gender equality. And so those are really focused much more on the women's participation. In terms of thinking about the peace building angle, um, we have two areas in which we're working on this at the UN Global Compact. One is our action platform on Sustainable Development Goal 16, where we're working on developing a framework for understanding, implementing, and reporting on business contributions towards SDG 16, and I can provide information on that to anybody who wants to join. And the other is Business for Peace, which is a platform that through our local networks allows for companies to be in dialogue with each other and with uh, others in multi-stakeholder groups to think about how to um, action and advance issues of uh, respecting human rights, advancing the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact, and promoting the SDGs in areas of fragility and conflict. And then finally, we do have our prime working group for academics on business for peace. And so that's a, a smaller group of academics and some um, NGO researchers who are looking uh, at research around these issues. So those are a number of ways that you can engage. I'm happy to provide more information, but I think what's particularly important is to think about the fact that these issues are not distinct unto themselves, all of them are related. So you are engaging through Business for Peace on um, SDG 5 and gender equality. And in turn, if you were to sign up for the Women's Empowerment Principles, you would also be influencing um, Business for Peace in your own way too. So thank you very much and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Michelle. Yeah, I think these examples really, um, you know, underscore almost all of the pillars of the WPS agenda. So, you know, prevention, protection and participation. So, um, yeah, just to underscore that uh, businesses really can do a lot in this space. Um, and especially with the help of the Global Compact. So we have um, one, que one question that has come through the Q&A box. Uh, I would encourage everyone who's on the line to use the chat box or the Q&A function to uh, send in your questions. We still have a few minutes left. Um, so just to kick things off, we have a question from Juliet Coleman, Director of Security Women. So Juliet is asking um, if you could comment on the importance of diversity and equal inclusion of women and application of Global Compact Universal Principles within the private security sector. So particularly recognizing the growth in private security as public security provision suffers funding shortfalls. Um, so happy for any of you to take on this question. Yeah, go ahead, Nicola. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think this is a very big topic, um, especially if we um, consider that security should be a, maybe a public good, um, defending human rights, uh, the rule of law, um, serve as like for all citizens. Um, the if there is shortfalls in funding of the security sector, the public security sector, um, the result is often corruption, as the individuals working for the security sector cannot sustain their own families, 
which gives which undermines the the rule uh, the the rule of law and um undermines the the role of the security sector but also it can lead to a vacuum so that then private sector companies are put in place to fulfill a role that the public security sector should play the problem there is this private sector companies or actors are not let's say a bodyguard they're not protecting citizen they're not protecting the constitution they're protecting the person that pays that's inherently in their job that's inherently in the bodyguard's job um, if we if we think in that sense that in, has an issue because who can pay it can, like the people privileged can pay the people already being privileged on top and having a surrounding of um, and maybe more access to justice more easy access to education and public goods so if there is now the security the, the person providing security is paid and accountable to the already privileged what does it mean for people who are not what does it mean of people who live in poverty who are excluded from access to justice who are out of maybe of the motivation of desperation commit illegal acts or even legal acts but face the barrier of a private security sector so this is extremely problematic from a gendered and diversity security perspective especially as they act in as the, the private security actors increase in situation of fragility we have we see private sector actors in countries where the public security sector leaves a vacuum and in post-conflict and conflict situations private companies doing peacekeeping missions contributing to that and the problem lies there they're paid by by someone and accountable to the the customer to the client and you therefore you don't have monitoring so if there is an uh, a misconduct let's say a case of sexual abuse the monitoring of the people's actions is so much harder because you don't have a central registry you don't have the same um, legal methods in place because it's an act under private law not under public law so there's a series of very problematic issues and i'm very happy you raised this question because it goes to the core of the women peace and security agenda um, and the core of the of the discussion around how do we want our security systems to be shaped who and and for whom and um i think i i think that's a very very good good and critical question we need to ask and i how the um, global compact principles um apply i would leave of course to to the colleagues and what possibilities there are for these particular actors but um yeah maybe they can go more into depth thank you Thank you, Nicola. Uh, Maha, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, I completely agree with Nicola's analysis of the problematic nature of private security uh, companies or forces. And I just want to add one uh, small thing is that it's also important to think about what kind of activities and uh, missions or operations that these uh, companies and uh, individuals would be participating in especially in situations that are fragile or conflict affected and how would that translate into impacts uh, on women so for example uh, the this military checkpoints, uh, raids and uh, house demolitions and arrests and all of these uh, things that uh, often the state is becoming more and more keen on outsourcing to private security companies. And I think these, uh, part uh, these examples that I mentioned particularly do have a very specific and disproportionate uh, effect on women in particular. Thank you, Maha. Uh, Michelle, did you want to comment on any of the uh, global compact principles that can be applied in this situation? The, the global compact principles are still high level enough and reflecting, for instance, the UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights that they don't translate down to a sector specific um, uh, language or, or uh, guidance. I, I would say, though, that we do have the voluntary principles on security and human rights, which doesn't touch on the private security in the same context in which we are speaking today, but particularly important across both public and private security to look at not only representation, but how women are, are impacted um, by some of the issues that, that Maha just mentioned, and also thinking about the fact that 
very little of this information floats to the surface. Um, we don't have a lot of data on on these issues. They're often underreported. Um, there's not a lot of support for for bringing forward these complaints also. And so um, having this heightened awareness, I think, is particularly important. Um, the I saw also some questions here, some additional questions. Um, and I know we're hitting up to time, but uh, there's one on engineering and one on guidance. Um, and just to just to say to the question on additional guidance, um, I think that you know Nicola is probably well well able to answer this question as I believe this is what she does um, from a consulting perspective. But also very happy to send through some additional resources um, in terms of leadership and best practices. I can compile some of those as well for the follow up to the webinar um, and sharing some consultants also specializing in this area. Thank you, Michelle, that would be great. Uh, so like you mentioned, we, we have come to the end of the webinar. So if any of you, um, our panelists need to leave uh, for other commitments, do feel free to do so. Uh, but I'm wondering if any any of you are available so we can steal you for a few more minutes to answer these two questions that have come in. Great. So. Um, as Michelle mentioned, Dawn has sent in a question about, um, so she wonders how uh, the engineering sector can engage effectively with the WPS agenda and the empowerment principles in ensuring that they build a world, um, including infrastructure, products, etc., that mainstream gender. Um, and she says that currently there is little crossover, but there is a lot of common ground. So again, happy for any of you to take on this question. Yeah, Nicola, go ahead. Well, I'm not an engineer and I know engineering can be such a wide range of, of topics, but as a general um, suggestions that is um, given to a lot of different companies or institution is by having diverse teams and by seeking information from different people that are differently affected by whatever is done um, can already give an insight for example if there's a dwell built um, or access to water if only one part of the population is asked let's say men who work in a certain area then maybe the women who are responsible to to fetch the water or who have um, who are dependent on clean water for let's say any shores then then there's a mismatch between the the target population for example or um it, it could be something like architectural designs of bathrooms um there has been a study i think in the us um on the usage of bathrooms and the big uh riddle why there's always a queue in front of the women's bathroom and there was a study done saying well women a go oftentimes with their kids so that it takes more time um women take longer in the process and so it just makes much more sense to build a more space in the cabins for the women when they enter with small children b to have more uh spaces and like that like this could just make the whole like tourist sites so much more effective for example or public buildings or anywhere and this is i think um and I don't even know where the engineering component comes in there, but just to say, if you ask the women, like what is like, or, or observe, like why is it different? Why, and, or, or you find these things like, and, and asking, okay, what is happening? Like, okay, they go with their families, uh, the timing or like what else is, is done? Like for example, changing diapers, breastfeeding room, whatever is done in, in the certain area uh, that goes beyond the, what, what let's say the, the like male counterparts are doing then that gives a could could improve just significantly women and men and diverse people in decision making are having a say having input um, analysis that disaggregates the data by male female um, and several categories relevant i think are some of the steps um, that are quite quite general um, also in terms of product design, we think about, let's say from, from medicine that is designed mostly by men of a certain um, 
body size, weight, and so forth, and therefore, for example, not as effective of all, or partly even overdosing uh, women who have less body weight and so forth. So there are some discrepancies where a gender perspective in, in other products, like the engineering sector, but I am thinking also like medicine, pharma, surgical industry, where it has not been thought through about the differences that are among us um, that are measurable. And by taking these measures and by analyzing the customers in and taking these diversity um, factors into your data just can make such a difference. Um, and I think that's, that's um, I think, could account for some of the engineering parts. But, but yet again, this is absolutely not my area. Um, Thank you, Nicola. And just because we're running almost eight minutes over time, I think I'll just conclude with uh, the last question from our attendees. So Simon has sent in a question. Um, what guidance would you give to businesses looking for guidance, leadership or best practices in terms of resources available to help them? Are there consultants specializing in this area or a resource for best practices? So maybe just one last comment from each one of you on the best guidance, best um, examples, or um, Nicola, I'm sure you'll have, you'll have something to say on this bit about uh, consultants and you know, best practices and leadership. So happy for all of you to give your uh, final remarks. Um, yes, there are consultants <laughs> um, working on um, women, peace and security issues. Often the people we work with is the public sector, I have to say, like uh, governments, NGOs, the United Nations. Um, but there are, there is of course a possibility to expand to the private sector and find the common grounds and the, the, um, the support. Um, in terms of good practices, in ter uh, women leadership seminars, there are quite a lot. Um, there are introductions to gender um, trainings that are for free. The, for example, the I Know Gender course from UN Women gives an introduction to gender equality, to the legal framework. There's a module on women, peace and security um, as well. Um, but then there's also transformative leadership seminars uh, done by the UN, um, but also several uh, other actors. And I think there are a couple of publications also on transformative leadership by actors like UN Women, but also, also others, um, specifically on UNP security, costing and finance. Um, we did a publication, this is quite a long time ago, and looks um, like very strongly on 1325 implementation. Um, but there's uh, economic empowerment programs by the UN as well um, on women's areas. And I think the Global Compact gives a lot of guidance already with the principles and initiatives that Michelle has um, also mentioned. There was more than a sentence, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, that was very useful information, so no worries at all. Uh, Maha, happy for you to uh, give your final thoughts. Thank you, Carla. I, I will be very brief by saying I think it's very important that the private sector centers people, humans, women, every human being, or, or like in, 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 uh, in their views and operations and activities and everything. And, you know, because the life, health, security and others are indispensable, but money is so, yeah. Thank you, Maha. Uh, Michelle, over to you. So I, I would say that, you know, of course, I'm biased um, coming from the UN Global Compact, but just to say that at the end of the day, these are issues that despite the fact that, at, you know, within the context of a webinar, we're talking about them in a very kind of global, generic way, um, these are still local issues. And the way to make advancements is at the local level. And so this is why it's particularly important that the way that the Global Compact is structured is also through our local network. So if you are not you know, participating in the UK network and you are a UK domiciled company, think about joining because that offers guidance and support, but also think about where your um, country operations are. How can you engage at the local level with your country operations um, and looking for organizations like the Global Compact that can help provide more of a link between 
uh, different stakeholder groups. Um, these aren't issues that are advanced by one company or one sector. They're certainly not issues that, as we see, are uh, fully advanced by government. So they do require multi-stakeholder participation. And I think that that's where um, groups and guidance coming from Global Compact and others can help uh, be a resource. So that's just what I would suggest would be to also make sure that you look um, where at where you're operating and how to responsibly engage in those in those jurisdictions as well. Thank you very much, Michelle. So just to conclude everything, I just want to say thank you to all our panelists today. I think your presentations have been fantastic, and thank you to all our attendees for tuning in. Uh, we will follow up with all of these pieces of research that have been mentioned today. And we'll also follow up with the recording of this webinar next week so that you can revisit the learnings from it. So um, thank you very much. And uh, if you look at the chat box, you can also see uh, the link to our next WPS webinar and also uh, the website of the, of the Global Compact Network UK, where you can see um, all of our upcoming events. We have a series on Black Lives Matter and business coming up and other, uh, other uh, events in the area of business and human rights that might be of interest to you. So again, thank you all very much uh, for participating in this, I think, overdue discussion. And um, I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for organizing. <laughs>